President Trump is back in the U.S. following his historic summit in Singapore with Kim Jong-un. The president is now saying there's no need to worry about a nuclear threat from North Korea. The commander-in-chief is also sitting down with Brett Baer, telling him U.S. combat troops will remain on the Korean peninsula. Is the military drawing down in South Korea? You kind of hinted at that. And is there going to be this kind of tit for tat? No, it's not drawing down at all. In fact, honestly, it was never discussed. I'm sure he'd like that. It was never on the table. We sort of understood that was never on the table. With that being understood and, and you know, you ask me a question like that, I would love to get the military out as soon as we can because it costs a lot of money and a lot of money for us. We don't get paid fully for that military, which, you know, I'll be talking to South Korea about. But uh, we have 32,000 soldiers in South Korea. I'd like to get them home. I would like to, but it is not on the table right now. At the appropriate time, it will be. The full interview airs on Special Report tonight at 6 p.m. Eastern. Over in South Korea, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo says the U.S. wants to see Kim Jong-un making progress towards denuclearization before the end of Trump's first term. This while the president is taking aim at the mainstream media for negative coverage of his landmark sit-down. Tweeting, so funny to watch the fake news, especially NBC and CNN. They are fighting hard to downplay the deal with North Korea. 500 days ago, they would have begged for this deal. Look like war would break out. Our country's biggest enemy is the fake news so easily promulgated by fools. <laughs> Greg, <laughs> you're an expert in uh, promulgated by fools. Yeah, I am. You know, uh, we're all here. Everybody here, by nature, is skeptical. We're skeptical about everything. And I find it, I guess, funny that the least skeptical people on Earth are demanding that we be skeptical. So these are the people that smear you if you are skeptical about Cuba or climate change models or stats on mass shootings or gun control talking points, if you're skeptical about the Paris Accords, if you're skeptical about Iran, if you're skeptical about communism, socialism, Venezuela, if you're skeptical about that, you're heartless. But you must be skeptical about this. Well, we're already there. We've always been skeptical. If you are, to, if you are a conservative or a libertarian, you're born skeptical. I had, I'm going to pull Dana Perino. I had Michael Malice on my podcast <laughs> today. And you know what? He, he tweeted something very, very good. And he also said this on my show, which is, you can find it. If you think the possibility of peace is worse than the possibility of war, there must be something wrong with you. Mm -hmm. And he says that uh, he has a good metaphor that North Korea is like a hostage situation. And we've said that before. There's 28 million, 27 million hostages. The protocol is you try to get the hostage taker to put his gun down. And you do that always first by dialogue. Right. And then you, and, and whether that means reassuring him with a film, that might work. But th that's how you do it. First, you want to save the people. And it is. There are people. It, it's terrible in North Korea. They have concentration camps. They, have geno they had genocide in the 90s. It's a ruthless regime. That tells you something. Containment doesn't work. Containment, containment doesn't make the hostages feel really good. No, it holds the this, evil in. Yeah, this, this could, I mean, a hostage taker, a hostage might actually think Trump is saving me. Yeah. All right, Dana, so mm -hmm. what do you make now in terms of we've had some time since this historic summit and the meeting to kind of see some of the fallout, the discussion, people's, you know, take different sides in terms of their opinion of what they think transpired? Well, I think it's still a net plus, right, for the president and for the world. Like, there is still hope. There is skepticism, but I think that it's important to note that the skepticism isn't necessarily about President Trump, unless you're, like, just an anti-Trump person. The skepticism is about North Korea and Kim Jong-un because the regime that's repeatedly lied. They've repeatedly agreed to similar things like what they agreed to in the communique the other day with the president um, that back in 1996 and 2000 and then in 2005 and then 2006. So they, th that's repeated. So I think the skepticism, one, journalists are skeptical, two, conservatives are skeptical, but three, right. the, the, the skepticism is also about the North Koreans just as it was about the Iranians. Mm -hmm. um, I also think that in some ways there is just this tribal nature of who you're going to trust. If you are a Democrat and you trusted Obama, you thought the Iran deal was a really good one. And you also might think that the personnel that they had, like Secretary John Kerry, you had a lot of trust in him. Conservatives did not. And I think you're just seeing the mirror image of that now. So um, Republicans will say, I trust President Trump. I think he knows what he's doing. I mean, we didn't get it all in one day. We never expected that. But they also respect the people that work for him. So John Bolton, Mike Pompeo. Whereas it's just on the other side, it would just be back and forth. I also think, though, that when it comes to 
the cost to Americans to have our troops in South Korea and in the region and to do these exercises, it's not just that it's input out. It's not just like a lost cause. I do think that it is in our strategic national interest for us to keep a presence there because you don't want to have to revamp it back up, mm -hmm. um, especially because we know that there are always dangers lurking around the corner. Okay. Now, um, Jesse, you know, obviously, and Dana brings up a good point about sort of the tribalism of it. And there's people, yes, that do trust, you know, President Trump because also perhaps they've looked at the record of what he has promised and what he has delivered in our, is it okay these days to be optimistic about hopefully having, you know, good outcomes? Trust, but verify. Right. And what happened during the Obama administration? I mean, they gave billions of cash to the Ayatollah. They had a really bad trade with Bergdahl, handed over five top Taliban members. They botched the uh, Paris climate deal. They botched TPP. They botched pretty much everything they touched, the Iraq status of forces agreement. And then Trump comes in to try to broker a peace deal, gives up almost nothing. And the same people that praised Obama now are complaining. I mean, Clinton and Carter went over there and built two nuclear re reactors, gave them millions of dollars. I, I, what happened uh, just the other day? I think Obama gave Trump the keys to the White House and said, oh, yeah, by the way, I've done nothing on North Korea for eight years, but now it's the biggest problem. You're going to have to deal with it. Good luck. So Trump tries to step up and, and bring peace to the peninsula, and all he hears is 100 percent negativity. It just destroys the media narrative that he's this big warmonger when he goes there to make peace. And they don't want to give him any credit mm -hmm. for trying to get peace. I'm not saying it's a done deal. It's far from a done deal. There's a potential here for a great deal. Mm -hmm. But all the deputies now have to hammer out the details. There's no you know, verification. There's no inspections. The phase out is still up in the air. We don't know whether they're going to destroy or when they're going to destroy all these facilities. That all has to be hammered out. But the spirit of the summit was very strong, and the political will between the two leaders appears to be very positive. And I think now we let the little guys hammer it out, and we'll see what happens. See yeah, what so, happens. Yeah. Juan, so the president gosh, used um, you know, rhetoric that some thought was inflammatory, but he was quite specific in saying that he feels that that played a part in terms of bringing North Korea to the table, where ultimately you know, he used n diplomacy to be able to achieve these ends. I think I read it differently, Kim, but I think he said he regretted some of the language that he's used in the but past. But he also said that he thought it was so, helpful in getting them to this point. No, I think he said he regretted and understood that it was provocative language, is what I think what he said. But to, to the larger point here, I think the big news today is, you know what? The Pentagon didn't know that he was offering to give up military exercises with the South Koreans. And maybe most importantly, the South Koreans didn't know it. And the South Koreans have played a key role in trying to make this uh, deal happen. And they, they're surprised, too. So what you have is kind of seated by your seat of the pants, Donald Trump working by the gut, say, oh, I think this will work, this will work. Uh, what about our allies? I mean, this is something that, you know, when you think about it, you say, as everybody else on the panel has talked about, let's go back and look at past criticism of something like the Iran deal. Oh, my gosh, at that point, it was said that this was evidence of Obama's inexperience, that he was a celebrity president, didn't understand the threats the world faced, of course, he got a deal that stopped Iran from developing nuclear weapons. What we have here is no such thing from President. No guarantee, no method of verification, Juan. nobody on the ground, no assurances, no details. It's been two days, so Juan. Me, no, I'm Obama had two no, no. years. I'm sorry. <laughs> it just started. I'm sorry. There was a signed deal, Jesse, and that's what it's the deal said. We stopped. They just started. We stopped, it. and nothing Come else. On. Nothing from. The North Koreans. So what you get is when Obama sat down and said, and I think this is 07, in the midst of his campaign, he said, you know, I'm willing to meet with people who represent repressive regimes because it's an opportunity to build bridges, to talk. Oh, my goodness. The conservatives, the Republicans said, what is he doing? He's coddling our enemies and he's alienating our allies. When Trump does it, oh, this is historic and the American media is the enemy. Talk about hypocrisy. Can, can I explain yeah. just the and difference between, I think when you have a strong, muscular, pro-American president like Donald Trump, when he is willing to sit down and talk to America's enemies, there's a different posture there. There's 
a difference between someone like that and someone like Obama, who did an apology tour, uh, who talked down American greatness and American exceptionalism, and his willingness to go and talk to America's enemies and not cut a great vigilant deal. This is the difference. Or do well, an, I think the American people or do see an apology that. tour. Well, let me right? let me just say then. I guess it There's comes suspicion. down. The way you guys see it is, it's just team sports. It's just if you like Obama, you like this. If you like Trump, you like this. But I think. Let's get away from that for a second. Let's just look at what the deal entails. And what you see is, and we talked about this a moment ago, 130,000 people living in South Korean gulags at this moment. So our tough, strong president okay. well, does nothing about nothing in the what deal. Did you about eight eight years to do hours. something about the gulags. Oh, Obama did I see. nothing. You can't, oh, I think that, I mean, you can't I, believe that anyone complained about actually something that happened that was very favorable for this country, for North Koreans, for South Koreans, for the world in general, give a chance for this to work. You don't like it if you use fire and fury. You don't like it if we go to war. You don't like it if we sit down no. and ha engage in diplomatic relations. Of course Dana. I do. I like that. Do you want, you want to go for it? No, I'm go sorry. ahead. I, I, the only thing I was going to say is that um, if you are skeptical of all of this and you're looking for somebody that you might be able to look to that you respect and you trust, that is not a partisan, but that is an expert in the region, Victor Cha is somebody who is a Georgetown professor and he was going to, well, he's worked in the government as well, but he was going to be President Trump's ambassador to South Korea. That didn't end up working out because of some differences. If you read his op-ed today in the New York Times, you would see like, he's actually pretty upbeat. He likes the strategy. He thinks that it's all headed in the right direction. Of course, there's a list of all the complicated questions that are yet to be um, answered. But overall, at this point, he's quite upbeat and positive. And if you're just looking for someone who's not a partisan and their take on it, I think he's a good one. Mm -hmm. And right. I'm not, you know, it's not totally tribal with me, Juan. I'm a little concerned about suspending the war games or quote unquote military readiness preparation. I think you need to be prepared for the North Koreans and that's why you have them. They're defensive in posture. They see them, the North Koreans, as offensive. They're, they're there just in case something happens and the North invades. And we want our allies to be prepared and on point. So we can ratchet those back up at any time. The big one doesn't come till spring 2019. So I understand why he did it in order to kind of encourage goodwill there. But it's not something I'm, you know, crazy about happening. I want these exercises to continue. I think but they're I important. Think, but so why, in, is, why is the president then saying, oh, Kim is a I'm funny guy? Well, he's funny, funny, he's funny looking. He's trustworthy. All right, Greggins. Uh, I, I just find it interesting that the, uh, the same people who have spent decades pleading for dialogue are now having one delivered with a giant bow. And I think that's what really hurts is that Trump is delivering what liberals have been promising and claiming is their expertise. Mm -hmm. And I think it disturbs and destroys their soul mm -hmm. to see. I, I, I mean, it's amazing to me to see how many people are actually against peace. And to return to the, the analogy of hostages, there are hostages in that country, right? Th what, what President Trump is doing is negotiating with the hostage taker, which is exactly the protocol that you do. And if it doesn't work, you know that Trump gave the hard sell. He exhausted every option before you go in there Absolutely. and rescue the hostages. And that's the point. Rescuing the hostages means they're going to die. This is the, actually right. the only way that, that you can do it. And I, I don't know. I think I am think optimistic about it because I think that Trump has, is getting, getting the North Korea regime to think past the sale. He's like a car salesman. He got Kim into the Corvette for the test drive. Yes. That video... Is brilliant. What that and I and, I, and, and uh, hats off to I guess it was Bolton, Bolton's team who did that video. But the fact is that was the Corvette. They got Kim to f get the feel of what it's like to be in an American car named Freedom. Yeah, well, and they showed him the he brought look at my car. He checked out the beast. He went yeah. outside to take <laughs> a look inside. Smell. Yes, exactly, exactly. And Dana, you made that point about the film. You'd be curious to see in years going forward whether or not CIA had some intel to yeah. say that that would be persuasive. Definitely. Um, in the uh, art of the deal.